The Gift of Rain by Tan Tuanang, Book Review. Before my trip to Malaysia, a co-worker asked me what my interest in the country was. It just sounds like it has a fascinating mix of cultures, I said. The native Malays, the Indians, the Chinese, and then the British colonial influence all together in one country. The next day, he handed me this book. I think you'll enjoy this, he said. This novel does a good job of describing all the multiculturalism of Malaysia you mentioned. Plus, it throws in the Japanese occupation during World War II. And so, that's how this novel was sold to me. And there are passages of this novel that do hint at Malaysia's cultural cultural complexity. On page 66, the narrator reflects, It was only just starting to occur to me what a strange place I had grown up in. A Malayan country ruled by the British with strong Chinese, Indian, and Siamese influences. Within the island of Penang, I could move from world to world merely by crossing a street. Several pages later, on the eve of the Japanese invasion of Malaya, oh sorry, a uh, quick note here. Uh, I believe Malaya is the na is, was the name for the country when it was a British colony, and Malaysia is the name that was given after it got independence in, I think, 1957. So Malaya is the British colony, Malaysia is the country right now. Uh, yeah, just, just a quick note on that. Sorry, uh, several pages later, on the eve of the Japanese invasion of Malaya, the narrator reflects, Looking back, it was strange that everyone, every Chinese, every Malay and Indian, knew with complete certainty that the Japanese would eventually invade Malaya. The Chinese feared that the Japanese would extend their massacre of the people of, Na of Nanjing into Malaya while well, the Malay and Indian communities hoped that the Japanese would free them from colonial rule. The majority of the English scoffed at the notion that Malaya would be attacked, feeling secure behind the naval batteries of Singapore. That was from page 133. However, these passages aside, for most of the book, the Indian and native Malay elements of Malaya are removed to the background, and the story co concentrates almost exclusively on the conflict between the British, the Chinese, and the Japanese. The story takes place in the island of Penang, which, along with Singapore, was one of the centers of the Chinese population in British Malaya. The book is written by a Chinese Malaysian author, Tan Tuan Eng who himself was born in Penang. It is a fictional story of a half-Chinese, half-British teenage boy in Penang, who befriends a, a Japanese diplomat on the eve of the Japanese invasion. The book was highly praised by critics upon its release, and even nominated for the Booker Prize. You can take the opinion of the experts, or you can take mine, but I didn't much care for it. I thought the writing style of the book was over the top, as if the author were trying too hard to impress the reader with his literary talents. I'll quote below a typical example, and you can make up your own mind. She told me her name, with an expectation that seemed to suggest I had been waiting for her. Yet it still took me a few seconds to find a mention of her in the vastness of my memory. I had heard her spoken of only once before, by a wistful voice in a distant time. I tried to think of a reason to turn her away, but could find none that was acceptable. For I felt that this woman had, ever since that moment, been set upon a path that would lead her to the door of my home. I took the glove hand she offered, 
With its scarce flesh and thin prominent bones, it felt like a bird, a sparrow with its, with its wings wrapped around itself. I nodded, smiled sadly, and led her through the house, pausing to put the lights on as we passed each room. The clouds had brought the night in early, and the servants had gone home. The marble floors were cold, absorbing the chill of the air, but not the echo of our footsteps. We went out to the terrace and into the garden. We passed a collection of marble statues, a few with broken limbs lying on the grass, mold eating away their luminosity like an incurable skin disease. She followed me silently, and we stopped under the casarina tree that grew on the edge of the small cliff overlooking the sea. The tree, as old as I, gnarled and tired, gave us a small measure of, sh of shelter as the wind shook flecks of water from the leaves into our faces. He lies across there, I said, pointing to the island. Though less than a mile from the shore, it appeared like a gray smudge on the sea, almost invisible through the light veil of rain. The obligation to a guest, however, sorry, the obligation to a guest however unsettling her presence, compelled me to ask, you'll stay for dinner? She nodded. Then in a swift movement that belied her age, she knelt on the wet earth and brought her head to rest on the grass. I left her there, bowing to the grave of her friend. For the moment, we both knew silence was sufficient. The things to be said would come later. Uh, that comes from pages two and three of the book. Now, if you enjoyed that passage, you'll probably enjoy this book. If, like me, you found it slightly bordering on pretentious, then this is how the rest of the book is written. Also, if you thought you maybe noticed an overuse of similes in that short passage, this is also typical of the author's style. When I first started reading the, reading the book, I found this incredibly distracting. The good news was that as I kept reading, I became used to the author's style. And once I was a couple hundred pages into the book, it didn't bother me so much. So if the first couple pages put you off, it might be worth persevering, from a stylistic point of view anyway. The plot, though, is another story. The narrative of the book is unfortunately like the prose, overdone and completely lacking in subtlety. It's a war story about the Japanese occupation of Malaya. During the Japanese occupation, the Chinese population of Malaya in particularly, sorry, in particular, suffered horribly and this book tries to convey that enormous suffering. But after a while, everything seemed so overdone that I couldn't take it seriously anymore. In order, in order to show us the wartime suffering of the people of Malaya, it wasn't enough that some of the main character's friends and family had to die. All of them, without exception, had to die. And so by the end of the book, the narrator's entire family is wiped out, as well as any friends he ever had. In real life, surely there must have been some people left alive in Penang after the Japanese left. Doesn't it seem a bit over the top that everyone the main character knows has to die? By the way, I spoil nothing by revealing this information. The story is told in flashbacks, and so from the beginning of the book, the reader already knows that the war is responsible for wiping out the narrator's whole family. This is a questionable narrative technique. Granted, it does increase the reader's curiosity at the beginning, when we learn that the whole family of the narrator was wiped out in the war.
But then, later on in the flashback scenes, when each successive member of the narrator's family is killed, the reaction of the reader is not shock or horror, but simply a bored, yep, knew that was going to happen eventually. The reader must simply stick around until everyone is finally dead, and then the story is allowed to conclude itself. Furthermore, I had a difficult time becoming invested in, in any of these characters, because none of them ever managed to seem like real people to me. They all just seemed like characters in a book. They do have some individual characteristics, but the author is not good at letting these characteristics come through naturally in the narrative. And so there are a lot of exposition, exposition passages describing what the personalities of different characters are like. Despite this book's many flaws, I'm glad I read it. And I'm especially glad I read it when I was traveling through Malaysia and visiting the island of Penang. This book serves as an excellent introduction to the island of Penang. The book is filled with references to actual places in Penang, and despite the slightly pretentious prose, the author generally does a good job of describing colonial Penang with all its sights, sounds, and smells. I read this book while traveling through Malaysia, and by the time I got to Penang, to Penang, I was excited to see everything the author had described. Present-day Penang appears to be a thoroughly modern city, with traffic jams, large shopping centers, Starbucks, and McDonald's, and outwardly bears little resemblance to the old British colonial island described in this book. But then, that is one of the themes of this book as well. Since the story is told in flashbacks, the narrator in the present day continually laments how the Penang of his boyhood has been swallowed up by the modern world. And you can see this very clearly if you visit Penang. Not all the remnants of the colonial days have entirely disappeared, though. And many of these surviving remnants, the author has done a good job of integrating into his story. For example, the author makes a big deal of describing Penang Hill and the colonial-era British summer homes at the top of the hill. When I went to Penang, I made a special point of checking out the hill and was delighted to see all the old colonial-era houses much as author Tan Tuan Eng had described it. The colonial era railway car up to the top of the hill is also described in this book, and so I was interested in riding up that as well. It's been rebuilt and modernized several times over the years, but still takes the same path as the original 1923 funicular railway car. On page 18, the book mentions a constant flow of vehicles went around the clock tower donated by a local millionaire to commemorate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. So when I was there, I wanted to make a special point of checking out that clock tower, not only because I was interested in the Victorian era, uh, but because it was mentioned in this book. Uh, and interestingly enough, I was touring Penang with a few uh, Malaysian friends who I had met in Melbourne and hooked up, hooked, joined up with when I was in Malaysia. Uh, and one of them, when we got to this clock tower, she said, you know, this was actually built by my grandfather. So that local millionaire that was mentioned in this book, uh, sorry, great-grandfather, uh, the, the local millionaire who was mentioned in this book, his great-granddaughter ended up being the one who showed me that clock, and I thought that was so cool. Anyways, uh, the British Fort Cornwallis, which plays a big part in the second half of the book, was another thing I checked out when I was visiting Penang. When my friends took me to see the Batu Ferengi coast, I was pleased to remember it as one of the places described in the book. The Penang Swimming Club was visible from my hotel room. It's also mentioned in this book. Uh, 
The legendary haunted house, mentioned on page 19 of this book, my friends also made a point of showing me as we drove past. I, I only saw it from the car, but I did take note of it because it was mentioned in this book. Also because of this book, when one of my Malaysian friends, actually the same girl I mentioned earlier, whose great-grandfather had donated the, donated, the, donated the money for the uh, Ju Diamond Jubilee Clock Tower, she asked me with a mischievous look in her eyes if I knew what the word Ang Mo meant. And I was able to show off my linguistic knowledge and reply that it meant red hair. Uh, it's mentioned in this book as being how the Chinese Malayans refer to white people. It literally translates as red hair, but it's, uh, the, the meaning is what they used to refer to white people. So in short, if you're planning a trip to Penang, this is the perfect book to read while you're there. Now, a note on the historical accuracy of this book. In the author's note at the end, the author acknowledges that the book is not entirely historically accurate. Quote, Historians, however, will quickly recognize that I have taken certain liberties with events. There was, for example, no ceremony on the surrender of the island of Penang to the Imperial Japanese Army, and the occasion depicted herein is based on the actual surrender in Singapore. Also, while the Emperor Kuang Shu and the Dowager Empress Shu Shi were actual historical figures, the forgotten Emperor Wen Zhu is entirely my own invention. The reform movement under the Qing dynasty occurred only once, in 1898, and my description of its reoccurrence in a weakened form eight years later is merely dramatic license. That's uh, from the author's note at the end on page 433. Now, perhaps I'm a bit of a purist, but I'm less inclined to forgive these liberties. My own view is that if I'm watching a, a Hollywood movie that's based on history, I'm willing to forgive a lot because it's a Hollywood movie and they've got to condense stuff uh, and it's got to be marketable and you don't really expect historical accuracy from Hollywood anyways. But when I pick up a historical novel, my expectations are different. And I think that's in part because my level of investment is is different. Uh, novels take me a lot of time and concentration to read through. They move at a much more slower pace. Uh, I think it's much easier, given the form of a novel, for an author to be historically accurate, assuming they've done their research. Uh, the, the form of a novel does lend itself more to historical accuracy than a movie does. So, as far as I'm concerned, if it's in a Hollywood movie, I'm willing to forgive historical accuracy. If it's in a novel, uh, if it's in a book, even if it's a historical novel, I prefer the book to be as historically accurate as possible. I mean, I, I know there are conventions in historical novels where fiction is integrated into the history, but uh, I, I like that to be done without, with as little damage to the actual history as possible. Now, granted, that's my own rule that I just made up on the spot just now. So uh, nobody else is obliged to take that view. Uh, if, if you want to have different criteria by which you judge historical novels, then fine. But th that, that's just what strikes me uh, as ho how I prefer my historical novels to be written. Now, in addition to what he mentioned here on page 433, there were some other historical accuracies that I found, or I think I found. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not an expert. I, I read one book on Malaysian history, which is A History of Malaysia by Barbara, Barbara Watson Andaya and Leonard Y. Andaya, which I've also reviewed on this channel if you want to watch my review of that. Um, so if I'm... I'm not an expert. If I'm getting anything wrong in my critique of his historical accuracy, please let me know in the, in the comments down below. That being said, 
On page 150 of this book, it says that the Parak Civil Wars of Malaya, during which opposing Chinese triads fought each other, occurred in the 1880s. Now, in the history of Malaysia, by Barbara Watson Andaya and Leonard Y. Andaya, they date it from 1867 to the early 1870s. Uh, although I suppose it's possible that there's more than one conflict like this. I, I don't know. Moving on to the next one. On page 326 in this book, it's claimed that the Malayan Communist Party was active in the late 1920s. But in a history of Malaya, they say that the Malayan Communist Party was not founded until 1930. Moving on to the next one. In this book, the Malayan Communist Party is portrayed as initially helping the Japanese army or being duped into thinking that the Japanese army will give them their freedom. In this fictional story, prior to the Japanese invasion, the Malayan Communist Party, lured by promises of freedom from British colonialism, attempted to carry out anti-British terrorist, terrorist acts uh, on behalf of the Japanese army. Now, in reality, and again I'm basing this on a history of Malaysia, the Malayan Communist Party was fervently anti-Japanese long before the Japanese invasion of Malaya ever took place. Uh, it is true that they didn't like the British, but they didn't like the Japanese even more than they didn't like the British. And the reason for that is the Malayan Communist Party was heavily dominated, almost entirely made up of Chinese. Uh, and the Chinese communists in Malaya were watching what the Japanese were doing to the, to the Chinese communists in mainland China and, and to ordinary Chinese uh, as well. Uh, and they were absolutely horrified of the thought that the Japanese would invade into Malaya. Now, uh, author Tan Tuan Ng, I think, tries to get around this by having the terrorist who, who tries to commit this act be an Indian Malayan and not a Chinese Malayan. And, and it is true that the Indian uh, Malayans, uh, or at least some of them, were actually welcoming of the Japanese invasion, at least initially. But I'm still going to count this as historically dubious because I find it hard to imagine that an Indian Malayan within the Malayan Communist Party would take this line. You know, you know, may, may, maybe if he wasn't part of the Malayan Communist Party, maybe if he was just like a rogue actor or an individual or something like that, I, I could believe that an Indian Malay would, would try and help the Japanese. But uh, if, if he's working side by side in the Chinese dominate, dominated Malayan Communist Party, then, then, I, then I find it very hard to believe that he would help the Japanese. I mean, what, what's he going to do? Go back the next day uh, to the to, to all his Chinese comrades and, and explain that he was trying to help the Japanese? Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, this is somewhat of a judgment call, maybe, but I want to count this as misleading in spirit, if not maybe in technical detail, for author Tan Tuaneng to imply that at any period the Communist Party in Malaya was collaborating with the Japanese. Now, after the Japanese invasion happens in, in this novel, then the author Tan Tuaneng does show that the Malaysian Communist Party was fiercely fighting against the Japanese. Although even here, he portrays them, uh, the communists, as just mindless thugs. Uh, apparently, he doesn't really like the communists. Um, this is typical of the one-note characterizations for many characters in his novels. Uh, the Japanese characters are portrayed in much the same way. Which is not to say that the book is anti-Japanese. There are many good Japanese portrayed in the novel, as well as many bad Japanese. But like the communists, the bad Japanese are all one-note characterizations. Brutal thugs with no further complexity or motivation. Final verdict. I know I've given this a mixed review. It's not the worst book I've ever read. I might even give this book a cautious recommendation. 
to anyone kind of vaguely interested in the history of Malaya or Malaysia. And I would give this a definite recommend to anyone who's planning a trip to Malaysia that's going to include visiting Penang. If, if you're at all planning any sort of trip that's going to visit Penang, even if it's just for a couple days on Penang, definitely read this book. Uh, I'm so glad I read this book while I was traveling through Penang. So the perfect book to read if you're traveling through Penang. Uh, otherwise, give it a cautious recommendation if you're interested in Malaysia. There, there, there were some interesting things about it. Uh, obviously, I have my complaints as well. Um, and by all means, I, I'm sorry if I presented myself as an expert on Malaysian history. I'm not. So if I got anything wrong during my fact-checking section there, please correct me in the comments. Okay.